Alrighty guys, welcome, welcome. This is Zero Stidy Jester. Thought I would uh, share with you guys my <clears throat> uh, getting ready for scenario here in Panzer Grenadier. This, of course, is going to be Kursk South Flank. Um... Uh, scenario and this is scenario number one and it's called Berizov Bound so let's read you the opening information it happened on the 5th of July 1943 and obviously it has to deal with the Battle of Kursk probably along the south front I'm guessing somewhere around the south front all right the opening of Operation Citadel found S. S. Reich Deutschland Division tasked with subduing the small village of Berezov, located just inside enemy lines. Picking their, way, picking their way carefully through the many enemy minefields and park fronts, to reach the village, the Germans encountered a battalion of guardsmen supported by the 3rd Battery of the 1008th, so I guess it'd be 108th or 1000th and 8th anti tank regiment. The game length is 12 turns long. The first turn is at 6 o'clock. No other important information. The German units will be elements of the German regiment, the SS Reich Division. And the, for the Soviet forces, we have the elements of the 52nd Rifles Guard Division, 230th Tank Regiment, and the 1008th Anti-Tank Regiment. So we got all the uh, units out on the board as the Soviets set up first. And I'll describe the setup here. So set up first anywhere in any woods or field hexes. And then anywhere else on the map, at least five hexes from the north or south edges. The Soviet player may place entrenchments in any three non-town hexes in the eligible setup zone and may place a total of four randomly drawn minefield markers in any eligible setup hexes where no Soviet Union set up. All units that do not set up in towns, woods, or entrenchment hexes may begin play dug in, and all units are guards unless otherwise noted. So you will see uh, there's a few uh, non-guard units. Actually, let's zoom in a little bit on this. So uh, first, let's zoom out so you can see what the whole map. It's just a one mapper. Uh, scroll up all the way. There we go. So I think that's pretty much the whole map there for you guys in one look. So you just have uh, four town hexes in the middle road going west east. Some uh, farm lands here. A few up here and then a couple hexes of uh, woods up here. So it's pretty uh, pretty barren map as far as terrain goes important part will be these field hexes and of course the woods hexes so per our scenario discussion or rules i guess i should say not discussion uh they can set up in any um woods or field hexes so they could set up here in the woods could set up here in the fields or down here in the fields or anywhere else in the map, at least five hexes from the edge. The Germans, where is their information? So the Germans any, enter anywhere on the north and or south edges. So this is the north edge. Down here at the bottom is the, is the south edge. And this is the north edge up here. And the south edge is down here, obviously. So Germans can come in in both south and north. They can come in from the north or they can come in from the, from the south. <clears throat> so let's look at what the uh, Soviets have here. So the Soviets have a total of 
seven infantries, which are going to be these units right here. The 5-2, so they have a strength of 5, range of 2, INF units. They have two heavy machine guns. You can see a heavy machine gun here. Uh, it is an 8 firepower, range of 4. They have two submachine gun units, which I believe they're both in the town, because they have very short range. 6 firepower, but only a range of 1. They have two anti-tank rifle division or uh, units. You can see those units there, the ATRs. They have a attack of three, range of two against personnel, and AT range of uh, one attack versus a range of three there. So that's what the ATRs are. They also have one Grant vehicle. This actually is a RKKH, which is stands for. <clears throat> you ready for this? Uh, yeah, I'm not even going to be able to say it. I don't think, but it's basically the regular Soviet units. Uh, and it has a tank leader. You can see right underneath the seven in the top right hand corner is like a little radio. That means it has a tank leader on it. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Brian, how you doing? Good to see you. Uh, getting some Panzer Grenadier deer in before the end of the year. Yeah, I'm, I'm going through the setup of the scenario we're going to be playing. So I just thought you guys might like to see this ahead of time. So you guys have an idea of what the units are, what they're doing and everything. Uh, so they do have that one... Uh, tank the Grant it must have been lend leased from uh, Britain or something and uh, it has a direct fire value of 9 a range of 5 and an AT value of 4 in a range of 6 uh, and because it has at least 2 in the anti-tank value it can shoot actually up to double its range at half its strength so it can shoot out to nine hexes with a strength of two it can shoot up to six hexes away at a strength of four uh, it also has two 82 millimeter mortar units you can see those units there it has a um Bombard value of 8 up to a range of 10 hexes away. It also has one 76.2 millimeter unit. And this is also the RKKA unit. And it has a direct fire value of, or I'm sorry, it has a um, bombard fire value of 10 up to 22 hexes away. And an 18 value of 5 up to six hexes away. We also have three wagons, which you'll see one right here. There's another one up here. And over here, I believe, is another wagon. And then it has one major, two captains, five lieutenants, and one tank leader, which we already, there's only one vehicle, but it does have a tank leader. Those are scattered around the map. So if we look at, say, uh, well, let's look at this guy first. This lieutenant here. So lieutenant, uh, right under where it says lieutenant, it has a 9 there. That is its morale value. And the bottom left-hand corner in the first triangle is its combat ability that it can add to the values of units so he would add one to this infantry unit so instead of attacking at a range of two with a five value they can actually attack with a six value and also that one combat value allows a unit such as this captain to activate units in its own hex plus any adjacent hexes so you will see that the leaders for the Russians 
that have combat values set up in the bottom left. So this way, this leader can activate all of these units to combine their firepower if need be. The last value on the counter for this lieutenant in the bottom right hand corner is a zero. That is their morale value. That is the bonus that they would give any other units in or adjacent to their hex, a morale boost to their uh, morale saving throws. So this captain here is good at both combat and morale. Uh, we can look at this captain, uh, lieutenant up here. He is also good at combat, but not so not as good as in morale, but being able to activate. You'll notice that these units here are in one of the entrenchments. We have basically uh, a very symmetrical setup here, believe it or not. Um, because we're not sure if the Germans are going to come in from the north or the south or both areas or both ways. So we've got a uh, infantry unit with a 57 millimeter AT gun in kind of like the, the lead hex, or we say. And then behind them is going to be a leader with a heavy machine gun. And the reason we're doing that, sort of say, is if we decide to combine firepower with our lieutenant and we had used the 57 millimeter AT gun and say this heavy machine gun, that would be an 8 plus 2 is only 10. And if we look at our direct fire table here, bloop, I'll bring that over. Uh, it's basically columns. So 10 uh, ten firepower would only get you not quite to 11, only to 7. So you'd roll on this 7 column. So with that leader giving you a bonus of 1, we can actually get this heavy machine gun and the 57 millimeter plus the leader bonus up to 11 and get that extra column. From so it'll be the 11 attack as opposed to the 7 attack, so a little bit better chance of hopefully doing some some damage to the enemies there. So uh, you'll see the same thing set up down here as well with the heavy machine guns and the um, 57 millimeter, and of course there's infantry in there as well. So but short range for the infantry, only two hexes. Uh, and then you can see we put all of our, say, bombarding weapons over here out of the town where they have clear line of sight mostly to up here and down here. And pretty good ranges of... 10 hexes for the mortars and 22 hexes for the 76 millimeter weapon. So I decided to put them guys out here for several reasons because, like I said, um, and they're inside a entrenchment, which gives them big bonuses for attacks. So if we look at, again, our little Panzer Grenadier charts, uh, entrenchments. So it's going to give them uh, all these bonuses here. So minus two on the direct fire table, minus two versus bombardment fire, and minus two versus assaults, and gives them first fire in case of assaults. Only one entrenchment allowed per hex, obviously. So hopefully the Russians are just hoping to slow the Germans down as much as they can. I mean, if you want to protect the town, we could keep everyone down here kind of in the middle of the map. But then you run into the problem where there's only 12 turns in this scenario. So the longer you can delay the Germans, the better off you might be. So we have uh, entrenchments kind of at our, I'll call this the south point units and 
our north point units, and then of course our main bombarding force here. Then of course we have the over here kind of off on the edge, I guess, is going to be another infantry unit and an AT rifle because if the Germans decide to kind of skirt, you know, along behind the forest, outside the range of all these guys, we need somebody that can deter them a little bit and say, oh, okay, come on, bring it down here. Don't bring it too close or we might shoot you. So if we just left this completely open, the Germans could just mow in down here, down, you know, down the sides. I guess that we call this the left side, both sides. So I decided to put some units out there to keep them, keep them honest and keep them, uh, keep them from just, like I said, just, just mowing down this way and then cutting over to the, you know, cutting down to the village. Um, and then of course the, uh, I keep wanting to call them forest texts, but they're not forest texts. They are fields. Let's call them fields because that's what they're called. They're fields. This is July, so the fields are in session. The most important thing about fields is their, what they call, hindering terrain. Which means that they're hard to see into and spot units. In this game, you can't shoot an enemy unit until you can spot it. So if these guys, let's say these Germans were coming in, and they're like, oh, I'm just going to shoot at these guys. They can't because these guys are in limited terrain. So the only way to spot anybody in limited terrain is by being within three hexes of it. So if this guy was to move it within three hexes, then he would see, oh, oh, there are guys here and here. But if you had, say, a mortar units over here or whatever, those mortar units couldn't see them because they're outside the three range. So that's what limiting terrain does in Panzer Grenadier, is it makes it so that you have to get closer to attack or see them, to spot them. Uh, the other way they can be spotted is if, well, okay, we're just going to bring up a unit. And as soon as this says, oh, okay, we're going to shoot at it. And once they shoot at it, they're going to be marked with a... Um, no. Fire marker. Once they're marked with a fire marker then units know where they're at and they can spot them. So, let's see if we can get rid of that. There we go. So part of the strategy, or not strategy, but part of the game mechanic is about, well, you can see a lot of these units have very close ranges. You know, the these uh, German units here, six firepower, only three range Three ranges, three hexes, blah. So you have to get close anyways just just to be able to shoot on units. But in Panzer Grenadier, like in normal warfare, right? Um, once you can spot enemy units, then that's where you use your artillery barrages to come in and decimate the enemies and disrupt them or demo uh, demoralize them. And once their enemy is demoralized or disrupted, their values go way down and their abilities go way down. And then you send your units in to be able to close assault and take them out the easy way. So that's the general gist of how, you know, the, I mean, there's a lot more mechanics than that, but uh, that's the general gist in Panzer Grenadier. It's a platoon level game. Um, you definitely want to, you know, get your units up, get them damaged somehow, uh, and then demoralized and disrupted. And once they're demoralized and disrupted, 
and a unit that's demoralized, it takes another demoralization, will lose a step loss, their values in close combat are severely limited, etc., etc. So, uh, so the obviously the Russians, being the defender here, want to use these to their advantage. They're not going to give them any terrain bonuses or anything like that for direct fire. But what they are going to do is make the enemy have to get close to spot them. And hopefully then you can shoot at them uh, to try and uh, damage them. Because in this, the victory is going to be the player who scores five to nine more points than their opponent. It's going to score a minor victory, and if you score 10 or more points in your opponent, you score a major victory. So you're trying to get 10 more points. How do you get points? You get points for, well, the Soviets get um, two points for every town hex they have at the end. So that would be two, four, six, eight points if they hold all of them at the end of the scenario. And then they get one point... Um, they get one point for eliminating any German unit, each step of unit. So most units are two steps. So, you know, you would flip this over, it'd be a reduced strength unit and then remove it. And again, it would, so that was two steps they would remove. So that would be worth two points to eliminate it. Well, obviously we're talking about German unit. So eliminating ger German units, and then keeping the town. Good for the Russians. The Germans, on the other hand, they get three points for every town hex they occupy. So a lot more points. So that we, they could actually get three, six, nine, twelve points if they were able to take over the whole town. And then they get uh, one point for every Soviet step eliminated. And tanks count double. And so tanks count double as well for the Russian player as well. I forgot to mention that. So every, st every step of tanks count is two points as opposed to one. So killing off the tanks are really, really good. So let's look at what the uh, Germans have to play with. They have a whole bunch of these SCH units. I forget they're called like Scherschnauschnach. So I forget whatever they're called. They're just SCH units. Uh, think of them as like a German grenadier, but they're part of the SS division, so they have some special fancy name. So uh, they have a whole bunch of these. They actually have 12 of these. So uh, quite quite a force coming down here. They have four heavy machine guns. Where are their heavy machine guns? Here are their heavy machine guns. And these heavy machine guns are a beast. 11 attack strength at a range of 5. I kind of already showed you guys the direct fire table. But you can see that 11 modifier for heavy machine guns is right there. So if you had two machine guns, that'd be 22. So you'd be way up here on this column, which means the minimum you're going to do is a morale check. So those heavy machine guns are nothing to sneeze at. Very, very powerful guns. In fact, compared to the Russians, where is the Russians? Right here? Yes. You can see the heavy machine gun for the Russians is an 8.4. So much shorter range and a lot less firepower. Uh, so they have a whole, uh, four uh, heavy machine guns. They have, oops, these guys are all limbered up because they were getting ready to move. They are 81 millimeter mortar units. They have three of them. They're all 810s. I just didn't, uh, I guess I should, or you guys might get confused. Let's unlimber all of them so you guys can see them all. There we go. All right, so they have three 81 millimeter units, so eight firepower, range of 10. Again, the numbers 
are kind of important in Panzer Grenadier. So eight, obviously, you get to that nice eight number. So your minimum, you're going to be on the seven column. So if you can get eight and you can get a few more points, you can get it bumped up a little bit. Or the most important thing is with mortar units, if they are bombarding the same location, you can combine them. So you could put two of them in a hex. You could get eight and eight would be 16. So you can get to that special 16 golem if you have two mortars in a hex. Which would be super good. A4 Airman, what's going on? You're reading Stalingrad by Norman Davies. Oh my God. What horror this East Front. Yes, it is. For sure. So you got three mortar units. We also have, oops, unlimber this. So you can see what this unit is. It is a 50 millimeter anti-tank weapon. Not very good against infantry. Only two firepower, range of three. Can do some damage, but that's not what his purpose is. His purpose is to get a nice four attack at a range of eight. And again, because it's a, it has at least two firepower in its anti-tank value, it can double its range. I'm sorry, it can uh, it can shoot at one and a half times its range at half the firepower. So it can go. Half of eight would be four, so eight and four would be 12. So it can shoot up to 12 hexes, but only at two firepower instead of four. So they only have one tank, which is this grant here. So I'm not sure how much you're going to need that, but it's there. They also have... A nice infantry gun, 75 millimeter IG... Infantry gun. Uh, it can shoot at a v uh, armored fighting vehicle, AFV. Only one firepower up to range of four. It cannot do the special long range thing because it doesn't have at least a firepower or two. So the most that it can shoot out is four hexes. <clears throat> but it does have a pretty good uh, range on the infantry. Four firepower up to 11 hexes away. You don't, I mean, 11 hexes away is a beast. That's great. So, you know, the, if the Germans can get it in this up here, you can shoot it all the way down into the to town or any of these other hexes down here. So, uh, then he's got some engineers three engineers and they are six threes six firepower range of three hexes pretty much the same thing as the shashnar or whatever what the hell are they called i should look that up they're called i'd have to like, try to find them. Oh, let's go back to the Soviets for a second, because I do want to talk about something. So each scenario module has their own scenario notes about that alter the base 4th edition rules or 3rd edition rules, whatever edition you're playing with. Um, in this, there's a special case on page number 3 about this 76.2 millimeter gun. It is section 16 here in the special rules. The Soviet 76.2 millimeter artillery restrictions. The Soviet artillery units had a difficult time reacting to the German troop movement during the Battle of Kursk. For this reason, Soviet leaders may not spot targets for the Soviet 76.2 millimeter artillery units for bombardment fire purposes in any scenario in Kursk South Front. Soviet 76.2 millimeter units therefore must spot their own targets when performing any type of fire. Soviet unit, units may spot for bombardment fire for Soviet motor units and for Soviet offboard artillery factors normally 
They just can't do it for this. So this unit has to actually spot the unit itself to actually shoot it. So having a leader up here can spot for the mortars to call in mortar fire, but it can't use it to call in this 76.2 millimeter. So... Um, let's see what other units they have here. So we looked at the engineers. He also has three of these Panzer Stug 3G units. And they have uh, seven firepower at a range of five. And AT value of three up to seven hexes away. And a movement of eight. That's what the top right-hand corner is. Uh, we also have two... Of these SK-7, these are prime movers, is what they call them. And these are the units that will move the AT gun and the uh, infantry gun. So what will happen is <clears throat> this will get put with this, and this will get put with this. And then when this unit moves, it will just take it with it. So, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and then, you know, then it can be done. And then the next turn, this thing can unlimber. So, and then, of course, the Germans have their own set of leaders. They actually have this unit here, which is S-T-A-N-D-E-R, or D-F-R, sorry. And, of course, the SS have these very interesting names for their leaders. This is actually a colonel, or what, the, uh, the, the same rank as a, a colonel for the Americans. And it's called a Standartenfuhrer. Standartenfuhrer. So it's uh, has the uh, so this is like their most highest ranking um, leader on the board. Then they have these guys. They have three of these guys. Oh, and this this leader, by the way, is a one one. So pretty decent. Then they have these guys, which are HPS, I'm sorry, HPTS TFRs. And those are equal to, say, a uh, captain. And they have three of those, and they got some really good draws, as you can see. They got, they got a 10-1-1, a 9-1-1, and a 9 -0 -1. The cool thing with this module, actually, is it has um, random counters. So when you're pulling your leaders, you just randomly pull from the stack and it randomly pulls the counter out. So you're just never sure what you're going to get, which is what you would do with normal Panzer Grenadier. So it's got a, a colonel, which is this guy. It's got three captains. Then he has a bunch of these Oberstromfuhrers which are basically equal to uh, lieutenants. And there are six of them. And look at these guys they rolled. Holy crap. They have an 801, which is eh. They have a 700. That guy needs to be shot and replaced immediately because look at the other ones he has. He has a 1011, a 1021, a 1012, and a 11... One, one, holy Moses. He's got some very, very good leaders in the lieutenant group. The highest number they go to is twos, and the highest number in the morale is an 11. Eights and nines are normal. So, if you get anything above, like, a 9, you consider yourself lucky. And he drew four of the six of them he drew were 10s or higher. Wow, that was really pretty good. And these are, these are no slouches either. 
Because normally, normally when you draw a leader, you're going to get at least one zero normally. And usually a one here or there. Um, you don't find a lot of leaders that have both values filled in. One ones or, you know, two ones. So that was that was quite a draw for the German player. That is definitely a coup. But it is based upon the scenario. And then he does have one other Scharfer, Scharferer, Scharferer who is a 9-0-0. So, I mean, this is kind of a typical leader draw there. Like, oh, okay, he's not very good, but normally a normal leader draw is like eight one zero or eight zero one or nine zero one or nine one zero, something like that. So just to compare the really good leaders the Germans have. Wow, just incredible. All right, 12 turns starting at 6 o'clock. And that's important because why would it be important? Well, let's see. Let's go to the turn track. So, turn track starts at 6 o'clock a.m. And that means it's dusk or dawn. Well, obviously, it's going to be dawn at 6 o'clock. Um, so, that puts into effect the normal daylight rules. Once you hit to dusk or dawn, um, so range is 10, 12 hexes for spotting. So everyone can, you know, because it's light enough now, people can see a couple hundred yards or whatever. So they can see people now a little bit easier. If you're, if you're starting earlier, then you can see that uh, it's, you know, like say we're starting at five o'clock in the morning. It'd be a one hex and then two hexes and then four hexes and then eight hexes it gets, as it gets lighter and lighter and lighter. Uh, the morale for the Germans is eight for the units on the map except for the leaders. And when they're reduced, their morale is a six. So eight... On their, if they're not reduced or at full strength, and six if they're been reduced. For the Soviets, they have two different groups. They have the Wrangler Guard units, which are uh, which are the regular morale, the regular guard units, which are the darker green units. Um, with the stripe on them, these are the guard units. The lighter green ones are the N or RKKA units. So the Soviets have two different morales. For the Soviet guards, it's eight if they're not reduced, and six if they are reduced. So full strength or eight, reduced strength is six. And then for the RKKA units, it would be seven morale, full strength, and six reduced strength. And then they don't have a third morale because there is no third unit there. They reduce uh, initiative by one for every three steps they lose. So right now their initiative is a two. For the Germans, they have three. The Germans will reduce initiative by one for every four steps they lose. So that's important based upon who's going to get first uh, every turn that every time the um, turn starts. The more you beat your opponent by, the more activations you can get before they can do anything. So, uh, and of course, the spotting range current visibility is 12 hexes. So, unfortunately for the Germans, if they would have launched this at say five o'clock in the morning, they could have got in quite a bit before the Soviets might have been able to even spot them. But they waited till 6 o'clock because they were not in any rush. Uh, so that's it. That's set up. We are ready to go. Um, I just need to probably uh, figure out if I'm coming in from the north, if I'm coming in from the south, or I'm coming in from both ways. 
The reason you might wonder why there is a wagon up here with this 57 millimeter is because I say the Germans decide to all come from the south and these units up here are pretty worthless. They're not going to be doing much. So I put a wagon in here thinking that maybe we can get some of these units turned around and bring them down to help protect. And the same thing with the south here. I put a wagon in here thinking that, you know, if the Germans all come from the north, then maybe we can get some of these units, put them in the wagon and move them up in the town or wherever we can move them to kind of help out. Because we don't know if they're coming from the north, the south, or both directions right now. Um, advantage is, is, obviously, the Soviets get to start all dug in, and they also have these... Oh, these guys are actually not dug in, because uh, they are in the entrenchments, so they would not be dug in. You can't be both. So these guys... There we go. And let's put that on the bottom... There we go. So we'll see how this scenario goes. Again, this is from south flank of Kursk, Panzer Grenadier. And uh, should be an interesting battle. The Germans obviously have a lot of firepower coming in. And they have some, I mean, just some amazing leaders. <clears throat> um... You know that uh, that Osterfer Führer two ten dot ten two combat and one morale. So what this guy can do is he could actually, if there was a setup like this, let's just set up some units here. To show you an example, let's get this guy out. Right here there he is so again uh, normally when you activate units um, you activate a leader and the leader can activate all the units in its hex and all the adjacent hexes if you activate them to fire a leader with a combat modifier which is again the one in the bottom left can activate and combined fire in hexes equal to his value. So this Ostrofer, Ost, uh, how do I pronounce that again? Ostromfuhrer, Ostromfuhrer, uh, can activate himself, all of his units in his hex, all of these units in this hex, and all these units in this hex together in one massive fire group. Uh, and if we look at our chart here, direct fire chart, right? Uh, if we had 18, 18, and 18, that would be what? 54? 54 firepower? So we would be on the 45 plus column, which means chances are they're going to be taking some Real good chance of taking some casualties, some definite huge morale checks. Obviously, the higher direct fire values you can get, the better off you be. Unfortunately, because it has an entrenchment, you get two. That's why that entrenchment is so important for the Soviets. Is two column shifts for an entrenchment. So even if you've got like a 45 attack, it's going to go down to the 22 attack because of the entrenchment. So um, you get a column shift if they're dug in. So the other units that are dug in, they're going to get a column shift. So a lot of firepower for the Germans, but they're, they're going to lose a lot of it because of the defensive posture of the Soviets right now but man that's what the, that's why this guy is so good is is normally you can only combine like this guy if this is the leader here right he wouldn't be able to add any other units to the fire group because he doesn't have any combat modifiers so the most he could ever do 
would be 18 attack. Where is this? If we bring this back over. So we'd be on the 16 column. And if we, they were under in, um, in, uh, in entrenchment, they would lose two columns. So they'd be down the seven columns. So you can see that this combat leader, and that's why these combat modifiers are so important. And, you know, we've only talked about the, really the, uh, the uh, combat one, but the morale one is probably twice as important in the long run. It's because anytime these guys are taking, let's say, uh, these guys did an attack and we have to do a combat, we have to do a morale check for these guys. Well, you know this morale check, we already looked at the game. Um... Where is it? Turn track. There we go. So we know the Germans have a morale of eight. Right? So if they have to start making some checks for their morale, right? And you have a leader that's adjacent to it, you would get a bonus to your morale based upon whatever value they have. So this Ostrofer there would give a plus one. So instead of an eight, it's a nine. So when he... First unit rolls a two. Okay. So he passes. Next guy rolls a seven. He passes. And the next guy rolls a six. So, well, in that case, they didn't need the bonus for the, the leader. But having these bonuses are super good. And especially when you get this other guy that has a two morale bonus, you're going to go from eight to ten. And I don't know, but that's a big difference when you <laughs> need to keep your units alive. So that's why leaders are so important in Panzer Grenadier is, man, you do like this awesome attack and you think, oh, yeah, now you're going to have to do a morale check or an M1 check or an M2 check, right? So in that case, you would add one to the dice roll. Or if it's M2, you would add two to the dice roll. So, you know, having those high morale leaders to help you, mm, so good. All right, well, that is our wrap. Thanks, guys, for coming out. I know you guys are having a nice little conversation over there about East Front. And uh, so I'm glad you guys were keeping yourselves occupied and having a good time. So hopefully you learned a few things along the way as we were talking about Panzer Grenadier. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to uh, check it out when we play through. So I it's getting like it's past midnight here, so I'm not going to be doing anything tonight. Probably going to be studying and deciding as the Germans now, because I spent a lot of time setting up as the Soviets. What would I do? You know, I was putting units around the town, and I thought, you know, if we move some units out, do we want to put the units in the forest? Do we want to just create like a like a, a line in the sand in both the north and the south? And if they get by us, then they can get to the town. Which units do we want to move? How do we use them so we can get to those important values the best way? You know, which leaners are going to work the best with the different, you know, obviously... With the bombardment value, um, hmm, that might be something to actually think about. I'm gonna have to check. I'm not sure if the leader can add the bombardment value to, um, to. Oh, a leader bonuses to bombardment values because we could take that 10 and get it up to an 11. That might be rather good. I'll have to double check on that rule because it might be worth putting a taking this leader and putting them over here if I can get that 10 up to an 11. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just trying to give you guys different thoughts and strategies in case you decide to 
try a scenario and play it, or when we go to play it, you guys can kind of understand what I'm doing if you haven't played this game before. Anyways, uh, I'm going to go ahead and save the game one more time. Just so that way I have peace of mind and I can always go back and undo it with a previous copy. So yeah, I'll probably spend a little time and figure out, you know, do I want... The most you can have is three combat units in a hex. So it's not like I can just say, oh, I'm just going to take all these guys and these guys and just put them together and just come charging in. Now, you can only have three combat units and any number of leaders and... Vehicles that are carrying units, like APC units, they don't count. So, or they count, but they're, there's a different count for them. But we don't have any of those in this game. So I'll have to figure out, do we come from the south? There's, we do have, you know, do we send some units from the north to keep these guys from moving? So, yeah, anyways... Thanks for coming out, guys. This has been a look at South Front. Scenario number one, 12 turns. Uh, Bezerov Bound. Bezerov Bound. 5th of July, 1943. Starting at 6 o'clock a.m. in the morning. Should be a fun go. And uh, hopefully, you, hopefully we'll get it to you guys sometime soon. Have a good night, Brian E4 Airman. Everyone, have a good one. We'll talk to you guys soon. Until then, take care, guys, and thanks for coming out.